there is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil, gave him jaws. All right, everybody, welcome back. Alex, how you doing? All right, doing great, doing great. How's everybody doing? How you doing? Today, you know, we got something really special. It's, it's spooky season. It's October. And we want to talk about some horror movies. And what better horror movie to start with than one of the all-time great horror movies. And you could argue this will be anybody's top 50 movies in general. Because it's just, it's, it's nearly a perfect film. Even with all the production problems and everything, this movie came out in 1975. Gross two hundred and sixty-seven million dollars in two in, in nineteen seventy-five money, which is insane. It was the highest-grossing film of all time until I think uh, what two years later when Star Wars came out. Right. Um. It's you know it's these days this movie would be you know PG thirteen or P or, or or rated R, but you know back then it was a PG movie, so everybody got to go see it. Cultural phenomenon, horror classic. Alex, I know that this movie is special to you, so I'm going to let you just kind of take it from here, and and we'll see where this conversation goes about the all-time great film, Jaws. Jaws, absolutely. This film, for me, I'm going to start before we even get to the film, but I'm going to say my little piece about it, as far as this film here actually introduced me to horror or or terror in the word um because before this film you know I, at the time i saw it i saw it in it came out in 75 but i don't think i saw it until later on almost when jaws 2 or after jaws 2 had come to the theaters that was the first time i saw it because i was young i you know i was one of 72 so 75 i was like three or four I, you know my parents were on <laughs> to take me to see something like this so i didn't see it until later on and back in the day you know normally films would run for a few weeks and they they'd leave the theater then they'd come back and they'd leave the theater so i think that my parents caught this right when i guess every, everything the tension was building up for the second film so of course they're going to show you know they're going to air the first film and the theaters to kind of get hype up and stuff like that so when i did see this film um it was me and my parents and it was uh, i thought basically i thought we were going to go see a cartoon because on that time, you know, again, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm like, oh, I'm going to see a cartoon. Popcorn and fun, you know. Uh, we go into the theater and, uh, you know, again, we got the intro and everything. And I see all the water and stuff. I'm like, oh, what is this? You know, it's just interesting. But I can't, I, I can't tell you how overwhelming it was to see it on a big screen. And I remember just sitting there as a, as a little kid, six years old. I'm just like, oh, my God, what is this? You know, so we lead into the, the beginning scene where, you know, the... Chrissy gets, you know, Chrissy gets the attack, the first attack, and, you know, she's the first victim. And I'm telling you, man, I cannot describe the feeling that I had. You know, and I think I, I shared this with you before. You know, I literally, like, fight or flight mode, you know, as a six-year-old. <laughs> I literally got up. My dad had the aisle seat. I got up, shimmied around him like I was Carl Lewis, <laughs> and I was heading for the parking lot, man. You know, they literally, I think the guy, all the way at the end, I think the guy saw my dad and Chase, so he kind of like nabbed me before I got out, you know, out the double doors and stuff. But, you know, it it stirred something in me, man. I had never seen anything that vicious happen. I didn't know anything about sharks at that time. So, you know, it was a ride for me that, as a six year old, six, seven year old. That was a ride for me. And that really introduced me to what fear was to be actually scared of something, you know what I mean? To the point where like you're like, like flabbergasted yeah so i developed a relationship with this film i mean everything every body of water was you know are there sharks in there <laughs> you know I, every time i i went to the library i was checking out a, a shark book of some kind trying to learn more about these 
these fish, these creatures that that just terrified me. Um, you know, seeing it on the big screen, I tell you the the stereo. I think Dolby was Dolby came out during that time, uh, and it was just like the sounds and everything was just so visual, it just pierced me, man. And I just, you know, I remember that. I'm in my fifties now. I remember it just like it was yesterday. So I've got a relationship with this film. And I've become, it's kind of like a love and, hate, love and hate thing. Like, I, I love this film so much for the characters and just, you know, be, the immersion, you know, being at, you know, involved with the things that are going on in Amity and they're, they're searching for this mammoth shark. But at the same time, still scares the crap out of me. I mean, all these things were on my mind when I went into the listed office trying to get into the Navy. And I'm like, damn, I'm really doing this <laughs> sharks. Sharks? Yeah. exactly what are, where the sharks at you know yeah <laughs> you know but i enlisted in the navy and stuff like that and like the people that know me my friends that i grew up with they they know that you know that i'm straight shook of this film so and i and i i you know as an older person now you know my 50s i really appreciate that that still stirs that that fear in me and i think that this is why the film did so well because i think you know at that time period nothing had ever been done like that before and i think the initial shock and introduction to this type of film was just done so well man and it just it stirred this primal fear that we all have you know as far as like being devoured by something bigger you know we always think that you know we're humans we're we're apex we're top of the uh, top of the food chain but we're not especially if it's if it's not in our element and in the right. water we don't we ain't running shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know especially not no 20 against no 25 foot freaking great white so no. um i you know again i i love this film i love every aspect of it and i do i'm a fan of the sequels as well so i'm not one of those haters while criticizing and critiquing this that and the third if you're a fan you're going to embrace everything because yeah. the people that are acting are still doing hard work to try to bring this stuff to us and you got to appreciate that that's what that's what we do you know yeah. so um we're gonna get right into the film so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i didn't throw that at you yeah. um well well you know what hold on real quick real quick i don't what's crazy i don't remember the first time i saw jaws like i don't remember I, well i mean obviously i wasn't born yet when it came out in the theater i was born in 78. i think I may have gone to the theaters to, to to see part three. I definitely remember going mm. to see part four. Um, <laughs> but I remember watching part three a lot because it was always on TV. Um, yeah, you know, on cable, big time. <laughs> but I don't. I know I saw part one previous to seeing part three. Um, I just don't remember when it was and whenever that was. I don't remember like ever. This movie never actually scared me because I lived in. Um, Raleigh in North Carolina at the time. And, you know, I had only been to the beach like once or twice in my life. So right, right, right. it had no, I had no frame of reference for that. It was no sharks in the hood. So like, you know, it didn't, it just didn't register to me like that. I was right, scared right. of other stuff that I was watching like, like freaking poltergeist and stuff like that. Like it was, had me shook. Um, so yeah, I don't honestly remember the first time I saw Jaws. I just always remember loving the movie. I, but it's one of those things where it's just so vague to me. I have no idea when I first saw this movie. I don't know what year that was. You know, I, I remember seeing American World from London. I don't remember when I first saw, you know, Jaws. So, yeah, it's just right. one of those little one of those little stories that I throw out there. Yeah, I had to, I tell you, I had to go back and actually look at my time because I was like, okay, well, I know damn well I ain't see this when I was three, you know, because I would have been like making all kinds of noise in the theater. Right. But, um, you know, I had to track down and, and look at like the time frame because you know you use, use a reference like Star Wars came out in like seventy seven seventy eight, yeah. so it was around that yeah, so it was around that time where you know I remember you know collecting Star Wars figures and then I remember uh, Orca came out, you know, Orca the Killer Whale, yeah. and uh, we went to see that, and same thing you know I'm I'm young so I sit in and in like the first five minutes. Here's a great white. I'm like, oh, y'all did this to me again. <laughs> Looking at my parents, like, here we go again. Right, I can't right. trust y'all, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but but yeah, that was that was during the time. So I remember that's why I kind of like I think it stayed with me because it was during the time period where I was absorbing so much stuff, and I just got so fascinated with like with like sea life and especially like the sharks yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so pretty much the, the synopsis of this film, you've got uh, there's a town called Amity. And Amity is like a you know uh, an island town that you know fishermen and you know nice peaceful life and actually the community uh, relies on uh, 
the tourists to come during the summertime to provide most of the income, you know, the, the, the back and forth with money and, they, and you know, they, uh, they you know, got uh, restaurants and, you know, whatnot. So they rely on that revenue coming in from the tour during the tourist season, especially with the beaches, you know, it's coming up with the beaches and stuff. In the beginning, you know, I think it happened on a weekend, but uh, the first attack was Chrissy Watkins. She uh, ends up heading to the beach after, you know, she has a, a gentleman, catches a gentleman's eye, you know, he's like, hey, 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 how you doing, wait up, you know. And she's like, come on, let's go swimming, you know, in the middle of the night. So she's go out, she goes out there and he passes out, <laughs> you know, but now whatever happens after that, because he's already thrashed, you know, an alcoholic, and she goes out there and, uh, again, just being at the right right place at the wrong time, you know, the, the shark enters the area, no telling how long it was out there. And uh, she ended up getting getting, uh, getting attacked and she's devoured. And uh, the next day, you know, the, the young man that, that passed out, uh, I guess he goes and does a missing person report with Sheriff Brody. Uh, Sheriff Brody, his wife and two kids, I think they are just re re arriving at Amity. I don't think they've been there a year, yet, yeah, maybe a few yeah. months. Right. You know, um, so he's he's got the the, uh, the chief job, so he's doing his thing, um, trying to get a new chief, trying to keep up with, with the community and the issues and whatnot. So he, you know, responds to the mission missing person report, and they, they call him a beast. Him and I think Dep uh, Deputy, Deputy Henderson, I yeah. think his name is Henderson, as a sidekick kind of. <laughs> they comb the beaches and they find the remains of Chrissy, and Chrissy is. You know, there's, there's not very much left. Yeah, um, peace. You know, we didn't. Right. Yeah. You know, enough to, to fit in like a a, a, a bed. <laughs> a bit, yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, he's like, damn. You know, uh, he's thinking. You know, he's being trying to be proactive. We gotta, we gotta shut the beaches down. You know, but unbeknownst to him, he's not. He hasn't been there long enough to understand the politics of Amity and and you know how the towns run and mm -hmm. they got a council and everything has to go through them. And he doesn't understand. He's He's a beat cop, retired beat cop from New York, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's doing, he's being proactive and doing the first thing that, that hits his mind because, you know, he's taking an oath. And that, that weighs heavy, you know, with any law enforcement, especially even coming from New York. So I dig that from jump. I was like, yeah, he's doing the right thing. They swarmed him. <laughs> you know, I think uh, the guy's name is Vaughn, uh, Mayor Vaughn, who's played by Mary, uh, Mary Hamilton. Uh, absolute wonderful performance. He's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so Mayor, Mayor Vaughn is talking to him and then, you know, I think the media guy name was Meadows um, and yeah. a few other people that were on the council kind of see Brody, you know, just rushing without checking on anybody. Hey, we got to close the beaches, you know, and they're thinking, oh, my God, you know, this guy's about to shut the beaches down. We got the fourth coming up and different things. He's about to, you know, mess up the mess up the money. Mm -hmm. So he uh, Brody had already talked to the coroner. Coroner says, hey, shark attack from jump. You know, he gets and starts to do what he needs to do, and they come and find him and stuff like that. Now the coroner's there with with uh, Mayor Vaughn. Now the coroner has changed his mind. Oh, it might have been a boating accident. Boat, okay. yeah. BS. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Brody's kind of like stuck in a in a hard place, man. So he's just like, okay. And then they're telling, hey, look, you know, just kind of chill out, you know. And you don't want to cause a panic until we really know, but, you know, we're not closing the beaches. Just, just chill. So he kind of like falls back right then uh i guess maybe the, the same during the same week you know they're, they're out on the beaches and the uh the, the second victim was uh young alex kidner alex kidner they're beginning to prune just let me go out a little longer just mm -hmm. um alex kidner and his mother i think are the only only two in that household i guess he was kidner was a was a single mom um but alex is uh, out there paddling around and, and you know with, with a large group of people out yeah. in the ocean and he kind of like drifts off a little bit, you know, away from the pack. And of course, you know, great white being a hunter, apex predator, he's going to pick off the one that's away from the pack, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and he gets plucked and, and yeah. he ends up dying. So you've already got one victim. Here's a second victim. Um, and it happened basically in front of most of the people that were out there. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think that uh, Mayor Vaughn and, and the rest of them kind of played it down. Um, still, you know, trying to figure out, hey, you know, we're not really sure yet. Um, and then uh, Mrs. Kidner puts a bounty of $3,000 out on the shark. Um, unbeknownst to her that, you know, that young Chrissy had died, you know, the previous yeah. weekend. They kept so that, they kind of kept that a secret. 
So like the town right. really didn't know that Chrissy had been killed by a shark because they were trying to save the right. boat. Yeah. Exactly. So that kind of like all that stuff kind of starts to stack. Meanwhile, you still got a shark out here, <laughs> a big shark. So um, so they, they put a bounty out. So then you've got most of the, the fishermen and, you know, in the community trying to hunt the shark down and whatnot, trying to look for a shark. And they do find a shark uh, because of the bounty. I think that attracted attention of uh, uh, Matt Hooper, who's like the second one of the second main characters that kind of comes mm -hmm. into into the uh the story and, Matt Hooper and remember is Brody, being Brody said, my bad Brody said like when he was talking to um it was the mayor earlier he was saying that maybe we should get somebody from uh university or something and uh right. I think he may have put a call out he may have put a call out but Richard Dreyfuss's character um shows up Hooper shows up at the same time as all those fishermen are going out to try to find the shark right right and he's like again walking into <laughs> walking into a hornet's nest, not really knowing yeah. what's going on. And he, had, you know, he asked to see the uh, the remains of Chrissy. Chrissy, you know, is, again, <laughs> they bring out this this yeah. little tub of whatever the remains are, and he's just stunned at wow that they haven't even called the uh, the coast guard or anything because this is definitely a large shark attack, mm -hmm. you know, on this on this young woman. Um, and then you know again i don't you know i'm probably hopping around in the story but uh, mrs kidner comes and confronts brody about her her son's death and finds out i guess through gossip or whatnot and, yeah. and information i guess maybe i'm thinking it probably was meadow meadows in the media somebody's you know leaked the information that you know there was a shark attack over the weekend it was chrissy chrissy watkins so she's you know of course she's angry because hey you know you could have stopped this but you know you allowed us to go to the beaches and you allowed my son you know, to come with me, and he went out there, and, and now he's gone. And it's your yeah. fault. And you know, you see Brody kind of go through a lot of moral conflict in this film because again, he's got he took an oath to serve and protect. You know, and ultimately, regardless of bond or the council, I still think it kind of falls in his lap because you know he, he's the guy that's yeah. that's in charge of of all of this. So Roy Scheider really, really like brought that out i think he really bought that out of his acting ability you saw kind of like the heaviness of everything that was weighing on him as the as the film you know progresses from from there man like the this is kind of like the you know the catalyst for like how the when the movie as the movie progresses you start getting introduced to new characters so like yeah richard drives says hooper shows up and like, right. like you said, there's this three thousand dollar bounty. So all these fishermen out here trying to find this shark, and they do find a shark, a tiger shark. Um, right. And and uh, after at, that was after I think Richard Dreyfus had um, Hooper had found had taught, saw the remains and did the measurements and everything. He was like, oh, it's definitely a big right, shark. Right. Um, you know, you see the guys, you know, they're pulling that tiger shark and he was like, yeah, I don't know if this is the shark, you know, it's, you know, the, the shark that did yeah. that kill Chrissy was a lot bigger than this. The mouth was a lot bigger than this. And they're like, no, it's gotta be the shark. It was a big, it was a huge tiger shark, you know, it's yeah, you know, it was pro pretty probable that it might've been a shark, but you know, there's no way to guarantee. And they say, look, I need to cut right. it open. The mayor's like, well, look, we ain't, we ain't about to have you cutting open a shark out here. And then that little boy's body spills out on the, uh, <laughs> on the pier. And, and I get that. That's actually that was actually a smart move. Um, and then you also get introduced to Quinn. Quinn yeah. during the meeting, during right? The meeting. During during the town meeting, because he's like, "Look, I'll I'll do it for you for ten thousand dollars." He said, "I know I know what you're up against, and I can find it. I can catch it. I can kill it." He said, "For I think he said for like four thousand, I'll I'll catch or I'll, I'll find it. He's like for you know ten thousand, I'll kill it." Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ten thousand dollars, you you'll kill it. Yeah, exactly. Right, and the mayor, he's kind of like, all right, whatever. You know, we'll think about it. We'll take it. Under we'll, we'll call you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like what really what really sets the movie forward is when they actually do the. Uh, it's not an autopsy. We're on the animal. What's it called? A ne necropsy or whatever. But anyway, they cut it open. Right. They um, they, they cut the shark over. Right. It was like you know a license plate and some fish and some random stuff in there, and they realize like, okay, this ain't the shark that took out those two people. Right, right. Right. So now Hooper's so got to go back and forth because he's got this issue going on with the mayor about closing down the beaches. But the mayor was like, look, we ain't closing down the beaches right before 4th of July. This is our biggest time of year. 4th of July. 
biggest day, right? But and the thing is, like you know, just just be, before that though, um, you know, they him and Brody, you know, after they had did, done a little drinking and talking and stuff, they actually take Cooper's boat out and they find, uh, uh, I guess, the remains of Ben Gardner's boat. He was one of the right. the local fishermen that went out there and and he actually got in the water and um, you know he found the remains of Ben Gardner in the hull of the of the of the ship of the boat that he had, and he found a tooth. And I guess in his panic, you know, he because he, after seeing the body, he dropped the tooth and got back on yeah. the boat. But I think that 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 scene right there, I'm, I'm glad you you brought brought that up so I can bring it right in. It was kind of like a pivotal moment because we had, I mean, we had seen the shark, or we kind of knew about the shark, but the characters hadn't really been in, in, introduced to like the, the how big the shark was. Yeah. And the tooth, I'll always remember the size of that tooth when he was on the water. He, like put that tooth in his hand yeah. and i'm telling you man that tooth went from freaking from the bottom to <laughs> to the top of a grown man's hand and i think in that point of time when he was in that water he realized the gravity of how much danger he was in by by being in there you know like, oh yeah. shit he's bigger than me so he got the hell out of the water but that kind of gave us an idea of what they're up against without you know kind of started that that trend to say oh man you you guys are in, in, in heavy water, you know, and and, and not yeah. even knowing exactly how how big the shark is until later on. Yeah. And so, we can't we can't forget that, cool. that we can't forget to mention that, you know, for people who maybe haven't seen this movie, or even if you have, you haven't really seen the shark very much in this movie at this point. No. You know, just no. kind of little glimpses, like uh POV of whatever yeah, the shark first, is saying. First, first you really haven't yeah, you really haven't seen the shark. There's a whole another story right. behind that, but and it became it was like a, a thing of necessity. It wasn't necessarily what the crew and Steven Spielberg intended when they were making the movie. It's just because of the issues they were having with the animatronic shark. You ended up right. not seeing it very much in the movie, but that ended up being the better version of this movie. You know, the less you see, right. like, less is more, because it's your imagination now. Right, you're you're yeah. imagining, and that's filling in the gaps. Right. And I think that was kind of decent too, because I'm sure that in in Spielberg's panic of damn, what are we gonna do? The damn shark is not working, you know. And eventually being there, you know, kind of like as a consultant, you know, with uh, I guess the other writer, Carl. Uh, I think his name is uh, yeah. Gottlieb. Uh, Gottlieb. Gottlieb. Yeah, Gottlieb. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that that eventually was like, hey man, look, you know, because in the book, you know, you don't really see the shark very much until later on, anyway. So. He kind of like I'm sure he kind of slid that to Spielberg. We'll try to just try to get like a first person point of view. Right. You know, maybe that'll work. You know, I mean anything at this point because the shark isn't working. And this is like a two yeah. hour movie, and I think the shark is on yep. screen like what four minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah you didn't I think see total time. It's only like a few long. minutes. Yeah, it's only a few minutes that the shark is actually on screen and screen in, in total time. So right, you know, less is less is more. You know, it's more about the tension that's built up for them trying to find the shark. Who was going to kill stuff like that? We mm -hmm. were we were at yeah we were at the point where now the town is going to uh, well let me back up there was another incident there was another incident on the beach yeah, well, yeah actually yeah. yeah actually they were trying to uh, uh, Hooper and uh, Brody were trying to explain to uh, Mayor Vaughn that hey look you know we found Bill Ben Gardner's boat we found his remains you know and that they, they were trying to explain about the tooth and. This problem isn't going to go away, and we've got to hire somebody to actually kill this shark because this ridiculous shark is is huge. And the mayor's like, "Hey, look, you know, the beaches will be open on the fourth. I don't care what you say. If you got to get extra people out there, extra security out there to, to keep an eye on folks, whatever. Mm -hmm. But them beat those beaches are going to stay open." And he's just being a real ass. Yeah. Um, so that, of course they beef up security, and uh, you know Hooper, you know, has his own boat, um, and you know they I got they they had a few people from. Coast Guard or maybe the local, uh, yeah. uh, you know, whatever, law enforcement, or whatever. whatever. <laughs> yeah. right? Fish cops trying to look out, right? So you know, people are are like still hesitant to get in the water because they know you know what happened. You know, is it you know a couple of victims, you know, two three victims before? So and then you know Mayor Vaughn goes over there and talk to <laughs> talk to one of the council guys. Hey man, why don't you get in the water, man? Like, everybody's yeah. still on the beach. So the guy, okay, you just get some freaking water, and then everybody starts getting in the water. And I think, you know, because of the large amount of people and all our, the splashing stuff that was going on, in fact, that you got those two kids, they were coming, doing the little fake shark thing. You know, all of this turbulence in the water, I think that the, the, the great white decided to go 
you know, to the to the little side pond where Brody sent his kids. Yeah. And uh, that one boating guy that was trying to help them, you know, get their little sail and stuff on, he it's end up getting uh, eaten as well. And then the shark kind of takes off. And I think that was the first time that everybody kind of like got a glimpse of the dorsal right. and the tail of the shark and how how big it was. Right. And, uh, and it's, after it's that, panic. I think. I'm sorry to stop mm-hmm. you. It's the, it was the yeah, you good, good. In everyone's face, where it's another scene where you don't really you don't get a good look at the shark. You see the fins, you see the tail fin and the dorsal, but like the shark after it kills that guy, it capsizes his boat and kills that guy, and then it swims past uh, uh, Brody's Brody, son. Brody's son, Michael. I think it was Michael. Right. Yeah, Michael. And the Michael look Brody. you you only see the POV, and it's like above water, but you see the shark coming towards. Brody and you just see his face looking at like oh my god this thing is and you can see in his face that this shark is huge huge exactly Exactly. yeah you see the people like they see the fins and they're like oh my goodness you know and and that just starts a whole like uh because it was a false alarm on the other beach where it was two kids playing a prank and you know the guys pointing guns at him and everything so everybody actual attack was going right right everybody already ran out of water and then you see that girl's like, no, in the lagoon, you know, I mean, in the pond, in the pond, there's a shark. Right. So Brody's like, okay, here we go again. So he kind of starts jogging. And then something clicks. He starts running a little faster. Yeah. And because he had just sent his sons over there. Right. Like, please, kids, go go play over there. Right. Safer, you know? And the damn shark is in there now. Like, right. Yeah, he freaking flipped out. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, when when they saw that, you know, that dorsal and that tail fan go by, they knew they had this huge shark in their hands. And right. at this point, at this point, now they're like, okay. Yeah, we got to close the beach and we need to fire, hire somebody to kill this shark. Do that without the I'm going to hire Quint to kill the shark. What? And I think Vaughn, uh, Mayor Vaughn, got the, the, the weight of that as well because he came to the hospital to check on uh, Michael, you know, after they took Michael to the hospital, Michael Brody. And he was like, you know, he's telling me, Chief, man, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I, I, you know, and, and my kids were on that beach too. And he's like, "Yeah, okay, great. Now let's do the right thing and sign right. this damn piece of paper so we can hire Quint to kill this damn thing." You know. Right. And he's like, "All right." So he he went ahead and, and signed it. You know. And uh, that's when we get you know that, I guess the introduction to Quint. They kind of go to Quint's uh, uh, little shark shack. Yeah. <laughs> this thing, and you kind of yeah. get the, the the first real uh, dose of. Uh, Robert Shaw's character Quint. I think yeah. Robert did an excellent job. I don't think anybody else Fantastic. could have pulled that off. Could have yeah. pulled that guy. That character was great. Actually, I like I like Quint in the movie more than in the book. I think in the book he was more of a just a fisherman, but in the movie, you know, he had this Navy background, and you know, we find out different things later on, and it just made it, his character that much more. That you see, he kind of goes through this psychological thing toward the end of the film where instead of it just just becoming a job it actually becomes some kind of crusade for him because yeah. of his past so everything kind of like changes chasing, like chasing Moby like chasing Moby Dick man. that was his white way of yep like like Ahab yeah yeah, yeah. so that that right there was kind of decent and then the fact that you know you get introduced introduced to uh the the little uh heat that Robert Shaw and uh Richard Dreyfuss is character had you know in character but actually you know they had kind of, of a little beef going on uh out, out of out of characters as well you know in, in real life you know i think they didn't get along very well and uh that shows. really played well <laughs> played well yeah. on screen you know i like the thing where like he's you know talking about hooper's hands and and your city boy got city hands and and he's like not only just freaking working class crap and this and that, right. but, you know he, you know again before that, you know, he had already told uh, Brody that he was rich, you know, so not only did he, is he a marine biologist, but he comes from a rich family. Right. So, you know, he's got money because that was his boat, all the sophisticated tech and stuff, all that stuff was his, he paid for out of pocket. So, you know, Dreyfus, you know, Richard Dreyfus' character, you know, Hooper's kind of like, he's not in like the political struggle with the town as far as like you know the, the money and you know needing and you know looking at the the terror i mean not the terror but the, the uh the tourist situation and and everything like that he's up completely you know up and above that so yeah. if you think about that you know from a rich standpoint he's kind of like he's acting genuine as a character like that's actually right. him he's he generally wants to help 
because he's getting nothing out of it. You know, he's not plugged mm-hmm. into like the community. And I thought that was kind of neat. And like, you don't really get the just of that until you, you watch it with an adult mind. Like as a kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. but you know, when you look at it, you know, as an adult, you're like, damn, this guy is totally, totally oblivious to what's going mm-hmm. on because he's rich. And he's not he, involved you know in what? I, I hadn't actually seen this whole movie uh, for at least 20 years. Yeah. You know, and that was a fact that I completely didn't even realize until rewatching it recently was that he was rich. Yeah, yeah he said it on a boat when, uh, when yeah. you know, when, and, and uh, Brody's drunk, like where you yeah. get all this stuff from, and these cameras and stuff. Yeah, I bought it. He's like, oh, you're rich or something. He's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was honest yeah. as hell. Like driving a boat. Yeah, yeah I am. Like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know they pile up on a boat, and again, uh, you know, on Quint's boat. And Quint's laying down the law, you know, I'm the captain, you know. And uh, he, I think, again, his issue with, Dry- with Dreyfus's character uh, was kind of big. And and I like the fact that it, it, the funny part for me was the fact that he, he said, hey, Chief, you know, you take him take him as ballast, you know, to balance the ship because yeah. he ain't really no good to he me. And I laughed at that. I was like, damn, man. And, and Dreyfus was like, are you giving the look like, are you serious, man? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought that was just hilarious, man. But. You know, later on, you kind of see the uh, the three of them kind of like trying to work it out. And you can see that Brody really was not seafaring at all. He didn't know anything about yeah. how to maneuver on a ship or anything. You know, Dreyfus had a, a little bit more idea of how to work a boat and how to be on, on the deck of a ship, you know. But Brody was just oblivious because you saw that, you know, he unhooked uh, a bunch of gear that was strapped down tight yeah. <laughs> while they were on the ship and all this stuff fell yeah. down and it's when oh, it was like hey man those air tanks will blow the hell up man you crazy yeah. you know so but i think which is uh, a great you know, setup which is a great setup right right but the end <laughs> yeah. if, if the there's end one thing we got to say you know one reason that this movie is so iconic and why it's is it was imitated so many times because you know we did we did grizzly we talked about grizzly which was just a, a jaws ripoff on land and of course, not right, not done as well, but that's what it was. And the reason that this movie is so iconic is that there's so many great things that happen in it that movies, directors, producers, writers can learn from. And one of them is, you know, setups. We talk about this all the time: setups and payoffs. The payoffs, right? You know, you don't just set something up with like saying, "Oh yeah, don't forget to load the oxygen bottles." No, you you put in a scene that shows that like. Okay, we're not careful with these things. They will explode. Right. Now, uh, subconsciously, you're not thinking that this is going to come back later because this movie's done so no. perfectly. But when it does, you're like, "Oh shit!" They, uh, they'll blow up. So we'll get to that later. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So my bad. I just want to so, talk about that real quick. No, you you good, man. You good. Yeah, that that that, that definitely was a uh, setup and payoff. Big time. Yeah. And it just again, it just shows that Brody's kind of like the odd man out, you know. You know, he might be the chief of police, but he's not seafaring like exactly. like Quint and 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 um and and Matt Hooper. So, um, but again, relationships, you know, and there, you see the little things, different things going on on the ship. But you can see that that Quint was definitely in charge you know, while yeah. while the ship was out there. And you know, again, you know, you get that iconic scene after they're trying to chum the waters. And you know Brody Stone throwing yeah. a chum overboard and throwing a chum markers over there, and uh, then the shark does. I think they call uh, they call it spy hopping when a when a great white or a shark kind of pops up out of the water, you know, just below the you know just right. just below the gills and then kind of goes back down, and he freaking like this. Come on down and chum some of this shit. His soul was snatched. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he stiffened up and walked backwards. And that's what you yeah. said, the iconic scene. And I think that was improv, you know. The, and the improv was, was scripted, but they had to yeah. raise, the, raise the volume on it, I think, a little right. bit. And he the, said he was going to need a bigger boat. The, the, what's perfectly done about that scene is that Brody isn't looking in the water when it happens. You know, he's chumming. Mm. He's talking trash. He's like, y'all need to be out here shoveling some of this shit. And he's, right, right. he's looking back behind him and shoveling the chum, and he's you know he smacks jaws with the chum, basically, uh, and then he just happens to turn around while the shark is still there, and he stands up like eyes big, you know he doesn't scream and holler, 
he walks backwards right. into the into the cabin and, and you know he tells Quinn hey you're gonna need a bigger boat you're gonna need a bigger boat totally stunned man totally right. stunned and then, like, you know can you imagine yeah. oh man yeah thing the size of a that, car that man. big ass head man yeah, look at that you like running and he just right man, i couldn't i i'd, I'd right. be done right there <laughs> Gone. <laughs> <laughs> Heart attack, stroke on yeah. board. Yeah. Right. Me, now man. they could have done, they could have done the movie cliche where like he sees the shark, but they don't see the shark. So he's like, no, y'all, right. I'm telling you, the shark is big. They're like, I don't believe that shit. Whatever. No, he sees the shark. He goes and says something. They go out and then they see the shark. Yeah, the freaking shark comes comes around and right. does a buzz past the ship, man. Right. And that's when uh, we got to got that size. Uh, comparison where where Hooper was like oh 20 footer and then mm-hmm. Quint you know with his his expertise was like nah 25, 25. And was like damn 25, 25. feet four, and you could clearly see up. this shark was yeah. right bigger than the boat man and I remember that part in the theater man just sitting there like like he's going to eat everybody and everything <laughs> you know <laughs> just standing there like this was going to be a bad yeah. ending here man there's no way they can beat that thing <laughs> you know Quinn kind of everything gets serious after that. Yeah. You know, you see Quinn going in and open up, open up the uh, I guess the the harpoon gun box mm-hmm. and start putting shit together and whatnot. And that was like again before you know when they tried to when he was trying to fish, yeah. you know, fish to kind of bring him up. Man, they didn't realize you know, I guess this this shark is is different. And I guess that fishing scene really kind of like showed a little introduced uh, Quint's character to like. This ain't gonna be like the the, the rest of these rides that you mm-hmm. had out here catching these sharks. This one is a little different. And I yeah. always, again, you know, you take take that thought in and like, you know, what makes a shark that size any different than any other shark? Because again, Quinn's trying to think about, okay, this is just gonna be another fish, and that's his mindset. This is just another freaking fish. It's gonna be another freaking ride in the park for me. I'm gonna yeah. spear this guy, bring him up, drag him in, and I'm gonna get paid. But in yep. actuality it's not and i would you know me being the nerd that i am always you know since back in the day i'm always coming up with theories like what made this great white different than than other sharks you know and i i came up with the idea that maybe because of the size i mean you figure it's, you know close to 30 feet it might have become lame some kind of way maybe even develop a mental issue right. so animals have have the ability to kind of adapt with their their own shortcomings and kind of make yeah. a way so that they can still survive. So instead of him like being able to chase prey that he would normally be able to chase and, and live normal like you know mm-hmm. a mammoth big behemoth of a great white, you know, he he had to figure out ways of eating and ways of getting by. And I mean, you mm-hmm. know, as far as picking picking bait off the line or or snatching people off no, yeah, <laughs> snatching I'm, people I'm off too, boats. Yeah. I mean he made away yeah. and i always thought that that kind of like made sense to me because you know again you know a lot of when you when you're watching this film a lot of people kind of try to put supernatural elements on the shark was thinking and but there are anomalies that happen in nature where you know again a uh, animal is trying to live with its shortcomings so it starts to do things differently and mm-hmm. i think that this is a perfect example of that without having to throw a whole bunch of like supernatural and yeah. You know, other theories in, involved. That's what happens. Kind of like uh, stuck with me. That's what happens with lions um, that become man eaters. You know, most of the time, it's not, right. they're, they're almost never hunting people. They become man eaters when there's something happening. Like they get a tooth abscess or a broken jaw, something yeah. like that. Like something happens, and it's just so much easier to catch a person. And, right. You know, right. Just, they, they just gravitate towards <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah. They're slower, yep. weaker. You know, it's, it's just easy picking. Um, right. But yeah, like you said, man, like the sharks just just going after folks. And at this point on the boat, they're taking it serious. They know this, this mm, ain't gonna yeah. be easy. Everything you know I mean? everything went up or not. Yeah. <laughs> you start you start to get that scene. Cause the movie shifts. The movie shifts. Once they get on the boat, that's about like I wanna say like halfway through the movie at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think when they were pulling out of port, I think it was I can remember it might have been like at the fifty minute mark. Right. Maybe a little bit yeah. less. Yep. Um, so, like, primarily, the movie primarily shifts to 
them on the boat. Like there's some scenes back on land, but it's, pr it's primarily them on the boat. Right. And it, it becomes almost a, a different movie. Because, mm -hmm. because now it's, you know, instead of protecting the beach and people panicking and, and investigating, now we're hunting. Right. That's a tighter, yeah. smaller, right. smaller right. Uh, thing. Mm -hmm. and, and you get that fantastic scene inside the boat at night mm -hmm. where um, they've already, they already had the experience with the shark earlier. Right, right. And, you know, they, they're, they're sitting around eating, they're getting drunk and telling stories. Know, Cause what else yeah. you gonna do? Yeah, they're telling stories, and that's when Quint tells them about the Indianapolis, which is a true story. Um, yes, the Navy ship that went down and and supposedly, you know, 150 sharks just destroyed a whole bunch of the guys that were in the water, uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, but it, 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 the, they said that the the ship, I think Quint was saying the ship sunk in like 12 minutes, and like yeah. 1,100 men went in the water, and I think like once. Once the rescue team showed up, when they, you know the rescue showed up, there were like two or three hundred left, man. And everybody, yeah. you know, all the other ones that didn't go down with the ship were, were eaten. Yeah. And it was a top secret, uh, top secret mission. So they were out there for. I think Quint was explaining they were out there for like seven days, man. So can you yeah. imagine? I couldn't even fathom yeah. that. You know, you've seen your buddies get picked off one at a time, man. Mm -hmm. You know, every, like, I think he said they average six an hour. Like, what the hell? Right. You know, for seven days, man. Right. Insane. Drowning, that's, bro. That, I'm done. That story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to take me out now. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm that, done. Seriously. That scene with the story is another iconic scene in this movie that other movies I've tried to imitate and duplicate. Mm. It's 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 super difficult because. An artist's performance is can be based on a lot of things at the time, and right. you know we don't. I don't know their exact motivation at the time, but like just the way they're sitting there telling that story, they're laughing and joking, and then it gets really serious when Quint tells that story. Um, that is one of those things that like it's it's just hard to it's hard to imitate. You know, you can try, but yeah, I think if you it's like it's almost like if you're trying to do it, you won't be able to do it. No. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, Dreyfus's character, if you really sit back and watch it, you know, they're joking and then he, you know, uh, Quint says that, you know, yeah, I was on the Indianapolis, you know, and then, you know, Dreyfus's character, knowing the story, because he's a marine, marine, marine biologist, he's in the sharks, with stuff like that, that's one of like the, the most vicious shark events that ever yeah. happened on record. His face, literally, he's hanging on every word that Quint says. Yeah, and Quint's going through the motions of just telling. Like, he's focusing on on Brody, man. But I mean, Dreyfus's character, Matt, is just in on every freaking word, man. And I think, uh, you know, a little bit behind the scenes thing. I wanted to uh, bring this up. I think it was a Howard Sackler, uh, and I think John John Millis. I hope I'm pronouncing his name. John Millis. Uh, they wrote Millis. There you go. He, they wrote the. Uh, that scene for um, Robert Shaw, and then Robert Shaw rewrote it to fit his delivery, and I thought that that was really decent. You right. know, I guess he didn't he, he he knew exactly how Quint would deliver it and how it should sound, and it came out freaking. You know, again, it's still here; it's lingering. <laughs> People are still talking about that delivery, man, and it's just top notch. And I think he was. Like he was a little drunk too, man. So it's just it, it just <laughs> came across really well, and it was genuine. And his care, you 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 thought it was Quint speaking. Yeah, you know, yeah. came off real genuine, man. So, and, but yeah, iconic yeah. scene, man. Yeah, and Steven Spielberg, being the expert director that he is, you go from you go from a uh, really tense scene early of them, you know, the shark being revealed to them. Mm -hmm. to like a more kind of jovial scene where they're just kind of sitting around drinking, eating, and then it becomes a little serious when Quint tells yeah. a story and then it becomes dangerous again. You know, the shark shows back up because if I remember earlier, um, didn't uh, Richard Dreyfus get the uh, tag on him? Right, it, when it, he put it on the, uh, on the barrel, the little strobe lights. 
Yeah. And like maybe it was a track. I don't know if it was a track or just a strobe. Yeah. But they put one barrel on them and uh, it, it ended up it ends up coming back later on. And while they're in there, you know, singing and, and goofing and, you know, well into being drunk, and the shark is banging at the hole and yes. causing the damn boat to sink. <laughs> and it causes the power to go out. You know, this is in yeah. the middle of the night. So they're like, oh, shit. You know, they scrambling, trying to, you know, trying to see what's going on. And they end up, you know, and the shark kind of like just fucks one of them and leaves. Yeah. You know, which I Cracks thought was just ridiculous. And everything. Yeah. 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 It just pulls off, you know, so the next morning. You know, you know, back to square one. They literally stayed out there all night because uh, I remember Quint talking to Brody, and Brody, you know, he was telling Brody, "Hey, look, we put one barrel on them already. You know, we're going to put two or three more on them, and 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 make him have to stay on the surface so we can get him." We're going to continue to jab, jab, uh, jab at him, and I, I laughed because you know every other, you know, after Brody <laughs> saw the shark, you know, he was like, "Hey, man, well, why don't we just go back in and get a bigger boat, man? We, you know, we yeah, come back yeah. out here tomorrow, man. We just." go back in brody took one to take his ass back inside yeah. back on land and i don't blame him man you have to nope. see something like that you know that, that kept coming up and i just laughed about that because i could i can relate to him because you know you, you were the one that saw firsthand what the actual thing was you know so yeah and that shit just burned burned a, its image in his mind yeah. you know, saw the fear that he had so <laughs> yeah i thought that part was funny but the next day you know of course they they put a few more barrels on it there and they're going at it, you know, with the shark going further out, chasing it. And then, uh, you know, something happens where it's a reversal after they put more barrels on him. And they end up trying to bring him back in toward the shallows. And that's when Quint kind of does this little psychological change here. Um, yeah. And, and becomes a little bit. He's obsessed. Uh, a little bit weird man it's almost like he's like he's losing it and again that you know being a you know the, the veteran that he is man you figure that trauma just kind of came back to the surface mm -hmm. dealing with you know everything that's going on and he's thinking like you know this, this is one of those iconic beasts and this is this was here for me i'm thinking he's taking yeah. it personal like yeah he's here for me you know and i'm just like and that's what i thought i always thought that and I just like, you know, yeah. again, he's going through this psychological thing. And that's weighs heavy, too, if you watch, you know, him smash from him smashing the radio up and everything. Because they just, yeah. you know, Brody's trying to radio in because the, the engine's jacking up, you know, yeah. the water and stuff like that. And they knew that they weren't going to, you know, make it in. And um, he just flips out and just kind of like makes it like an isolated incident. You know, after the after the engine breaks down, they're like, they can see land, but there's no way they're going to swim. Swim right. still still out of reach. You know, but that's when uh, Dreyfus' character uh, kind of, you know, uh, I think, uh, who, uh, not Hoover, but um, yeah, yeah, Hoover. But uh, Quint asked him about his, his gear with the shark, shark cage and everything. And I guess uh, he's like, what can you do with this, you know, this, this spear thing here? And, and he, Dreyfus introduced due to the fact that he has some strychnine. And pump 20 cc's of strychnine nitrate into him if I can get close enough. If he yeah. gets close enough, he can jab the shark with the strict nine and injection, and it'll kill it. Quint says, "Hey, you know, you think you can get that tiny needle through his skin? You know, uh, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. have to get close, you know." And again, you know, you figure they're in desperate times now because the engine's dead; they're still off the coast and it's sinking. You know? mm -hmm. So um, they put the shark cage together. Dreyfus, you know, his delivery here with this whole this whole scene to the point where he gets in the water is just like you see the the tension and the pressure that he's under and then like and I, I like the fact that if you look at quint and brody they their faces kind of are like you know like they're not they're not telling him that he's done but you can <laughs> right, you can look right. at their faces and go man i don't you're know like, yeah. come back better, <laughs> better him than me <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you know it's just crazy as heck man and i just you know again i'm looking at him and i'm just like what the hell is matt thinking man again you know he's so into you know being who he is man and he just offered it up like hey you got a better idea man you know what yeah. we're gonna do wait for the sucker to sink the boat and eat us come on man you gotta right. do something but ultimately i think that once he <laughs> got in that cage and he's like i ain't got no spit man <laughs> yeah. can't even freaking put the spit on my goggles to yeah. put my shit together he kind of knew that he was having doubt, doubts about his uh <laughs> decision for the size of that shark man i mean that shark yeah. again was a mammoth man. just made that little cage look like like it was a freaking a square sugar box man you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know so he goes down in a in a, in a cage and the, the shark does a pass and then he you know got the strict nine stick there and everything getting ready for i don't know why he thought that the shark was going to come dead on just pivot right. back around and just come dead on to him 
because sharks, you know, great whites don't work that way. He should have, I think that he should have known that they would be either attacked from underneath or behind because they're, they're hunters. You know, yeah. they're going to always blindside you. And sure enough, that damn shark took the shit out of him <laughs> from behind. <laughs> and that, that scene, that water scene, man, I mean, I was already scared as a kid, you know, already up to that point. But I'm telling you, man, I freaking, I didn't know I was going to pass the hell out. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at this shark and then again, it's on this big freaking screen. And you're basically sitting in that damn cage with with Richard Dreyfuss' character. Yeah. You're seeing this big ass mammoth mouth coming at you and just breaking that damn cage up, breaking those steel beams up like it's freaking like they're toothpicks, man. And I'm just like, Jesus, he's done. Yeah. He's freaking done. There's no way he's gonna be able to get out of this thing. And the first initial hit from the rear, he drops the stick. I'm like, come on, man. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> and then like he can tag, he can the bell like yeah. hey, hey, bring me up yeah. now man i fucked up now you're yeah. stuck and you're done down there man however the thing played out man you know luck was with him and the shark's breaking the cage up and he he ends up being able to shimmy out of the situation and and, and then hide uh at the bottom of the ocean you know and then yeah. in the seabed while the shark's flipping out and and tearing the cage up and uh i think uh some of the behind the scenes stuff was the fact that uh Ron and um, the scene was filmed by Ron and, and Valerie Taylor, the, the shark experts at the time. Um, and the, the cage was empty um, for the shark, you know, going to like the shark attack. They did a lot of stuff in the tank, you know, the close up stuff with the stunt management stuff. But the actual shark scene was filmed by, you know, it was a real great white tearing, yeah. that, tearing that fake cage up, a small cage up. And what happened was because there was nobody in the cage in the way that the shark was. So viciously tearing the cage up that Steve, Steven Spielberg decided to keep the scene because it was so violent and so stunning. So that kind of uh, saved Hooper's character because in the book, Hooper dies in the cage. Right. He's eaten. And I guess they were going to follow the same, the same route, you know, in the film. But because the way the shark, the shark scene was, it just kind of made it so like, we can't not put this in the screen. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the movie, we've got to have this. So they kept it. And that in turn, you know, uh, kind of sealed, you know, uh, Hooper's character to, to live. Mm-hmm. So he shimmies down to the seabed and the shark, I guess, gets ultra pissed off. And that's when you see him come up and, and just <laughs> 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 just jump on deck, you know, yeah, you know, body slam the boat. back yeah. in. Yeah, the back end is starting to starting to go down. And I'm like, man, I, as a, like I said, as a kid, man, I'm Right now, I'm in freak out mode. Now. <laughs> My dad's like, shut up, shut up, man. Shut up. You know, like, I, I'm the kid going to shut up, man. You know, like, come on, you see this shit? I'm looking at this shit, you know. So the boat's going down, and uh, Brody's trying to hold on to Quint, you know, and Quint slides down, and, and, and he meets his fate, which I thought was, I don't know, man. I, I've heard, you know, I've read different things, but I've heard people talk about Quint's death scene. It was adequate. I hated to see him go, even now as an adult. I'm like, I, mean, I think that he deserved a little bit better yeah. um, because he was trying to avoid that fate and at the same time trying to step up and do the right thing and help and help the community out. So for him to die like that, I guess it was it was coming. You know, if mm-hmm. you say, you know, if there's karma involved or whatnot, I guess, I guess it was coming. But damn, man, that's a that's a bad way to go. And the stunt man, you know, Quint's double, you know, that, that I don't know how many takes they had to do that. I think I, I know I saw Quint. Uh, on some video footage where Quint was doing a few close-ups, spitting blood, and when the shark kind of crushes his chest, and I think he did it a few times. You know, they're soggy and wet out there, man. But that stunt man had to be dragged backwards into the water in that shark's yeah. mouth, man. Okay, who the hell you are? To me, that traumatized him like a <laughs> mom. Take five, take ten. I'm like, look, man, I need a mental break, a mental health yeah. break, man. You crazy? I ain't gonna keep doing this shit. <laughs> Can you imagine having to do that? Like, yeah. Top dollar, man. I don't care if it's a fake shark or not, you know? Uh, man, this movie be, better be a had hit. Had to be traumatized. <laughs> Hell yeah. Had to be freaking traumatizing, man. Had to be traumatizing. Yeah. But anyway, you know, Quint meets his demise. Um, and then, uh, you know, Brody's, you know, thinking that he's the only one. So he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And kind of like, I guess he's trying to scramble, grab as much as he can. And uh, the shark, you know, comes into the cab and comes at him. So he, you know, fends it off with another oxygen bottle and he ends up throwing it in his mouth and um then he kind of shimmies up and gets on that thing i guess like you know whatever that long post is the spy post yeah. or whatever and the shark kind of banks out and comes back around and he ends up you know firing 
fire trying to fire at the tank you know this is after he fights the shark off with his spear you know again i'm just you know physics and just you know reality with the <laughs> shark would pluck his ass off of there and we would see yeah. credits and that would have been it you know? yeah, so we probably found it would have found matt hooper at the bottom of the ocean and yeah. too and that would have been a wrap they didn't come home you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but again we've got a hollywood movie we got to make it you know as heroic and awesome as possible so he ends up shooting the tank and the the, the shark ends up blowing up and that was you know again you know shooting an air tank it does physics doesn't work that way you know, but right in this movie but he, he gives he gives the line <laughs> don't don't forget the line Fire, you son of a he says smile you son of a bitch you son of a bitch yeah like and of course the shark's all teeth so yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's a bit I mean, that's one of those things that, like, in real life, you know, are you going to take the time to be like, smile, you son of a bitch? But, no. But in a movie, we freaking love it. Got to make it, got to make it freaking, you know, as epic as Dramatic. possible. Yeah. But, yeah, in reality, I'm trying to empty everything I got, trying to yeah. hit that gas tank. You know? I mean, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the diving tank. So. But as an ending, uh, you know, it, it was satisfying. I know it was a Hollywood ending. The book did not end like that at all. And personally, I prefer... The book ending, just because it's a little bit more realistic, you know, yeah. the book ending was the shark succumbing to the damage that that had happened. You know, they spearing it and putting barrels on it. And, next, and you know, after a while, you know, the shark just kind of gave out right. and it just drowned. And that's how the shark died. And then Hooper, I mean, not uh, Hooper, but um, uh, Brody ends up just getting some stuff together to like make a makeshift raft and he paddles in the paddles back into right. into land and quint dies but quint kind of dies the the way of ahab he didn't get eaten like he did in the in the film in the book he kind of gets wrapped up in the the rope in the barrel the barrel rope and then ends up drowning because when the shark starts to sink you know and he just yeah, the yeah. shark pulls him down with it so he ends up drowning instead of being eaten but uh, yeah. i prefer I prefer the book ending. That's just me personally because I kind of like the fact that uh, Brody lives by the skin of his teeth. And I think that if they were to kind of like they were to stick to the, they had st stuck to that, I think the audience would have been kind of like more of a more of a tense than a release type thing. Oh my God, you know, like because the shark just kind of gave out just as it was <laughs> about to about to chew on his ass, you know. It was yeah. like so that would have been iconic, you know. But like, again, it wouldn't have been that big huge hollywood big finish explosion and fish chunks <laughs> you know again I, it's just a wonderful film man and like i said we could make a separate video just oh yeah with the behind the scenes and just stuff, the behind man. the scenes so yeah because we going that's, so a whole, that's another happen. hour just behind the scenes um right i do i do want to um talk with you real quick about you know impact and mm. influence influence of this movie um right I briefly mentioned it at the beginning, but there was so many imitators, even to this day, so many imitators of this pretty much perfect film, right. whether it be, you know, something like Grizzly or, you know, Tentacles or Orca, Alligator. Yeah. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Almost none of them were have quite the impact of Jaws. You know, when it, when it comes to tension, uh, a creature that you don't get to see that much, you know, uh, you know, a few years after this came out, you know, Alien came out and it had kind of a similar uh, thing without seeing, you know, about like not seeing the, the alien creature a whole lot. Um, right. And I think, you know, Ridley Scott may have learned something from from watching Jaws a few years earlier, but the, the impact of this movie is just it's immeasurable because yeah. a lot of stuff that people see now they may not even know that this that was influenced by a movie that came out in 1975 and you know it created another thing this movie created the summer blockbuster yeah this they, was the they, first summer blockbuster the prototype for the summer blockbuster absolutely yeah. and it sure as sure as i was man i mean i you can look you can google you know jaws opening night 1975 and, and they'll show you like you can see different footages of fronts and, and the lines wrapping right. around these big ass theaters man and people waiting for hours just to get a ticket to see this film man 
it was like you said it was a phenomenon i mean i remember i remember yeah. you know um most talk about uh, and i mean it still carried on when it, when when they started showing it on tv man. Yeah. it started coming on you know nbc cbs saturday night specials or whatnot yeah. man <laughs> people were piling up in their their uh their living rooms trying to see this film again and, and i'm not sure because one thing i did forget to look up is um alternate versions of this movie i'm almost sure there's like alternate tv versions where like some scenes are different i know that's a fact for like jaws three and maybe two and definitely four yeah um, definitely four four had an international yeah. version and then it had yeah. the american version yeah because yeah. i yeah. you know four is one of the ones i went to movies to see and this is why i was living in alaska I went to movies to see four i yeah. remember mario van peebles dying and in yep. the TV got, version, got when, I saw, taken right, by a shark. when I saw it on TV, I was like, he didn't live. What, you, what, is, what is this? You know, he got bit all across the chest and died. Like, yeah, but there's, there's down, different versions. Took him down. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then I think the international version is like, you know, he comes back later on after everything's said and done. And Ellen Brody, you know, kills the shark with the front of the ship. Yeah. Like, hey, man, I need some help. You know, right. over there like, hey. Oh shit, Jake! Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's the happy ending, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah there's two versions of that. Because <laughs> um, yeah, something that maybe people don't know. Um, if you're, I don't, I don't even want to say significantly younger than us, but just younger than us, is that we would see movies. Sometimes we wouldn't be able to catch a movie at the theater. All right, there was no Netflix, right. or whatever. You had to go to a video store to maybe rent it. Um. The theatrical version and the version you may have seen on VHS or on TV or on cable. Because you got to remember, if it was on cable, it might have been the original version from the theater or it might have been a slightly altered version. If it was on TV, right. it was definitely going to be different. Right. They're going to change yeah. it and tone it down right. for television. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, prime example <laughs> of this, and we're going to talk about this movie soon, is The Thing, 1982. Uh. The TV edit for that movie is completely different. Like it's, it's almost a different movie. So TV edits were a thing back then. And mm -hmm. you, if you were at an age where, oh, the only time you ever saw Jaws was, uh, was on, you know, network TV. Well, you grew up with that version. Then when you see the original, you're like, hold on, I don't remember these scenes. I don't remember this mm -hmm. happening this way. Because totally the extra footage, yeah. yeah. They had to fill out, they had to sometimes shorten the film, sometimes they had to make it longer because you had to pad it out with commercials. You had to do edits for like violence or language. So there were scenes that were filmed and filmmakers back then did this on purpose. They would film extra scenes for like the TV versions of the, of the movie. So okay. that when a movie was edited for TV, they would add these scenes in and maybe take out others. So you might have an almost totally different movie um that's that's just one of those things about like older movies that you know we may have grown up with two different versions of the same movie um i want to go go back over the the actors real quick mm -hmm. and we you know kind of like jumped into the film and not really spoke about uh, who was in it but you know you got you got roy scheider that mm -hmm. played sheriff brody you know roy you know he's been everything from the, the french connection to uh and i watched a few episodes of sequest um uh, you know DSV. great actor Great actor, man. Uh, you got Roy Scheider, uh, and then you've got uh, Robert Shaw. And I don't really, I didn't really know too much about Robert Shaw at all. I remember, you know, being a Bond fan. I remember seeing him in from Russia with Love. He played mm -hmm. that one agent that was, that was, I think it was Rod. You, you told me it before it was Roger Moore, right? That he was fighting from Russia with Love. Ooh. I think it might have been Roger. Well, I can't it remember. Been Roger Moore. I can't remember. But he was a he was a big dude in that film. So that that's where I remember him from. But he did. I mean, it's just, I and mean, this is this film is his legacy, you know, because um, his son right now is carrying on. The the I think it's called the shark is still working. And it's like a Broadway play where it's like, right. you know, him being his son, you know, playing, reprising his father's role, and then you got you know somebody being Roy Scheider, another one being uh, Richard Dreyfuss, and it, it's kind of like it's not really like them filming the. It's not them in the movie, but it's like them, you know, I guess between takes and whatnot i think that's right. the, the synopsis of the the way that the, the play is and i now i hope it comes close to virginia because i want to see it um because i keep saying yeah, like all the footage in, and, and stuff he he died in 1978 so he didn't know he didn't make it much longer yeah, after that movie yeah um robert shaw he died yeah, uh, robert, he was 51 years old 
Yeah, fifty one. Oh man, I didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But he did did great, great performance, man. Um, I think he did the sting and. Uh, you know, I think he was in the deep too, but I don't, you know, I, I gotta go back and watch the deep because, you know, again, the deep was like one of those other films that kind of came back with, uh, you know, came with like the little jaws aquatic adventure type thing. And I, I watched it once a long time ago. And I think that one of the major things that was in that thing, I just remember this, this moray eel coming after people. It was like an eel. Yeah, yeah, you know, the yeah, moray yeah. eel. The no, wait, you know what? <laughs> Hold on. Was that the deep? Was that the movie that had, um, Oh, oh like my god! I can't think. Type film, yeah, because they were like exactly there was like morphine. Detail. There was like a bunch of morphine down there. But he was in that. I just don't remember, you know, what character. I want to go back and check it out and see, see right. what what his character we played in that film and how you know what, what his delivery was and how how good it was. You know, Richard Dreyfuss is, you know, he's still active. He did you know Close Encounters and and uh, uh what else he did american graffiti all kinds um, of movies and of course you know i remember him from from what about bob i think what about bob was a funny ass film uh, you know he's yeah you know, he's a great actor he, he, he kind of he's very versatile he can be funny he can be serious you know but he nailed hooper matt you can't do matt hooper without him man you know right. they'd have to find somebody as equally as as smooth <laughs> on screen right. i think he did a great hooper um uh, lorraine gray I mean, Lorraine Gary, I'm sorry, she played Ellen Brody. You know, she's been on you know, a few things, too. Um, but she did, you know, she did a great film. I think one part that we didn't mention and I wanted to bring up before I left was the fact that when Brody was getting on the boat with uh, with Hooper and with Quint, I think Quint was talking a lot of smack <laughs> while he was in the driver's seat. She Again, she's, she's knowing that, you know, that she might not see her husband again, you know. And, then, you know, Quint's up there talking smack about, you know, seafaring and this that and the third and arguing with hooper and different stuff like that and she kind of runs away from the dock crying knowing that you know that this might be the last time you know i see my husband and it's different than the book because see the book they actually came in at the end of the day when it got dark they actually came into port so he had more moments to, to spend with his his wife you know before things like got r ridiculous but in the movie you know they went out and they stayed out so we felt it was all over so that's the difference between the two. But I remember seeing her upset, and from watching it again before we did the, uh, you know, did the uh, the review here, I remember her being upset, and I'm just like, damn, man, it's got to be really heavy for her to, to see that, you know. And, and they just played such a great couple, you know, you know, great American family, so to speak, with two boys. I just thought that was really nice, but it's way different in the book, and I don't want to get into comparison, but the relationship wasn't that great in the book right. <laughs> <laughs> at all. So. And you know, again, got Mary uh, Murray uh, Hilton who played uh, Mayor Vaughn. Great yeah. performance. He really, you know, he, he didn't like him. Didn't like for him. various reasons, but yeah, yeah he, but it just he became, played he perfect became ass. prototype prototype asshole uh, <laughs> mayor, town yeah. councilman, like person yeah. that's just in the way. Yeah. Right, person that's just in the way. He became the prototype for that, which is a whole nother thing not, that like movies have imitated for years. Right. Got to have a guy like that, yeah. Yeah, freaking <laughs> asshole. Con concerned about money and and everything other than like 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 human human life and well being. Right. You know what I'm saying? Can't forget that when this movie was being uh, produced and when it came out, this this was right after the book was out and became like a best sale, best seller. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Benchley wrote wrote this story. Um, right, good story. Picked up, you know, by the studio and it was given to Steven Spielberg and this was only his second studio movie. Peter Bensley's book came out in, in 1974, but before it was published, uh, Universal had already bought the movie rights in 73. Yeah. So that's that's wild. Like, so he eventually was pretty much rich <laughs> right. before, the, before the, his book even came out. Right. I think they bought it for a hundred and... Twenty-five thousand, which of course was in seventy is equivalent to I think good money. modern day was equivalent to like a one million dollars for today. So you figure yeah. he's already loaded, man. Like, geez, right. you know, a lot of okay, money. I found it. Exchange for this film. <laughs> <laughs> I found it. he had done some TV, uh, television shows. He did like Columbo, um, but his first TV movie was Duel. It's called Duel. Duel. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I gotta go back and look at that. Yeah. Um, 
And he actually did a couple other, few other TV movies before that, but then he did Sugarland Express. That was his first studio movie. And then uh, he did Jaws. So yeah, Steven Spielberg, we know, you know, the you know, the rest is history with him. Oh yeah. You know, he's, yeah he's, you figure he's after this film, man, it's, this film grossed four hundred million worldwide. So I mean he put him on the map. And that was just one film, and you figure you gotta take into consideration, you know, all of Indiana Jones stuff and all the other stuff that he's done, yeah. you know, close, close encounters. encounters and, you know, it's, it can be debated whether he actually directed Poltergeist or not, but whatever. Mm. Um, that that movie's still associated with him. You know, he Gremlins. There's so many movies. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So he just you know, he started off with money and just just kept stacking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kept stacking, kept stacking. Yeah. But again, you know, we you know you can't say enough about about the films that he's done. It's just you know a lot of this stuff is just mm-hmm. iconic, you know, especially all, you know all the Indiana Jones stuff. But I mean, just sticking with Jaws, man. I mean, the Jaws, this film here just changed the world, literally. Yeah. Like, it changed the idea that, every, you know, it changed the idea of, you know, everybody, you know, looked at a body of water different, you know? Yeah. And all you had to do was play anything from John, you know, any, anything from the movie from John Williams, especially that iconic theme, you know, the, the score, first yeah. Jaws film. And everybody was like, you know, it's all automatic. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> some sharks in there <laughs> i mean it just it literally changed the world man and it's crazy because you know after this film came out the spotlight was on sharks and you know it it had a positive effect and a negative effect because, negative. You know, again it caused a lot of overfishing because of the fear that it caused for sharks and stuff but you know you had people like you know ron and, and valerie taylor you know the, the ones that did the new uh, national geographic stuff and all the shark films. And I think they actually came out. They were the ones that helped make that that one film that came out during this time, or might have been a little bit earlier, um, called uh, Blue Water White Death, and it was kind of like a, a mm-hmm. documentary of great whites, great white. And I think that was done because of you know the was it Rodney Fox was the the one guy that kind of had the non the worst non lethal shark attack by a great white ever. You know he was like being held together by his wet suit when they when they pulled right. him. he was spear fishing. You know, right. a, a champion spearfisher, and he was literally held together by his wetsuit when they pulled him, you know, out of the water and tried to get him to the emergency. And actually lived. I mean, he had so many different injuries that happened from whatever that man with great white that grabbed him. And look him up on Wikipedia. I don't think you're gonna say it's Dan because he was in spleen, chest. Yeah. I mean, he was wrecked, he was wrecked. And I remember reading about that you know, as a kid, and then like you know, remembering the stuff that happened in the jaw, and I'm just like, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can I can see that all of that happening. <laughs> you know, the movie is iconic, man. It's you know it was nominated for uh, best picture at the Oscars. It didn't win that. It did win best sound and uh, it was an original score, I think. Yeah, um, best the original score with uh, John Williams. John Williams, actually, yeah. with, uh, John Williams. Uh, it was rated number six as the all, one of the best all time scores ever. Number six. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he just it's, it's, it's nailed that. Absolutely noticeable when you hear it. You already know what yeah. that is. So, yeah, what we'll have to do, man, we'll have to revisit this movie with like a behind the scenes, um, just, a, just a breakdown of all the drama that went on trying to make this movie. Because it was basically a shit show trying to make it. Right. And it, it turned out be to be made perfect. into a. It, it was made into a film all by itself of all the. Yeah. Shenanigans and, and weird stuff that was going on, yeah, behind the scenes. And also, we, we can't forget about uh, Percy Rodriguez. Uh, this oh, is, you know, what we you. talked about yesterday. That thank you. That you know, this is the guy that narrated the trailer. So the first words that you that you heard that you heard from the trailer was was Percy Rodriguez, who's a you know, African American narrator. He also did some TV. And movies, he you know he was in Star Trek for a while, and uh, Planet. He was a major character, I think, in Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Um, but for him to you know, narrate the way he he did, man, you put him right up there with James Earl Jones and Morgan yeah. Freeman because those iconic words, man, that were were said during the trailer. You know, it was as if God had made the devil and gave him jaws. I mean, I, right. and the whole time I'm thinking, like, I didn't know this was a black guy. You know, right. like, I didn't what? know him until a few days ago. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> I went back and started yeah. looking at the, the stuff he was doing with Eartha Kitt and stuff. This guy was mm-hmm. on the same level as like as like um, uh, William Marshall, you know, from the yeah. Blackula. Just absolutely, just wonderful 
delivery of lines and well spoken is just badass. And I'm trying to figure out like how did we not hear about this guy before? You know, right. again. It's crazy. Had no idea. And he went on to do like he narrated the other trailers as well. So he did the uh he did two. He narrated the trailer for Jaws Two. Then he narrated the trailer for the the sneak I I guess the teaser for the Jaws teaser, three yeah. in three D and he narrated the Jaws four trailer. You know? So uh, these things just kind of like they, they, they get biased without us even knowing. Yep. So kudos to him, man, because again, that was, uh, uh, putting a trailer out there before you even seen the film, those were the words that he spoke. First thing he, that touched your ears and gave you the, the I guess, the for coming of terror, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sure yeah. as hell felt it when he went to see yeah. the film. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was iconic, man. It was iconic. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's uh, that's Jaws, y'all. I mean, if you haven't seen Jaws, I and mean, where have you been? You know, do yourself a favor and see one of the greatest <laughs> movies. Not one of the greatest horror movies. This is one of the greatest movies ever made. And, you know, you may not agree with me, but you'll definitely agree this is one of the best horror movies you've ever seen. You know, one of the most well-made, well-thought-out, well-scripted. You know, even with all the behind-the-scenes nonsense, they they put together something special with this. It's a once in a generation movie, and you really Absolutely. really got to check it out. Um, and to me, you know, I leave I leave you I leave you with the final thoughts. Like, I know this, year, <laughs> this, year, this, year, this movie here is, is eternal for me, man. I'm always going to have, and I'm talking about you know having people have relationships with film, and this film has gone back and forth with me for years. And I mean, I don't expect that relationship to stop anytime soon. Right. You know, I I still. I still get, you know, I still feel the tingle of terror every time this, this comes on TV. I own all, all the films. I, I got them in 4K. So, I mean, I just, I love this film. I urge fans, I mean, the Jaws fan, the fandom has just exploded in the past 10, 10 or 15, 20 years, man. So that this, people are still breathing life into this, this, uh, this film and, and this, this, this world, this universe of Jaws. Um, and you know they're still talking and debating and speaking about the, the sequels and I'm a fan of all of them you know, because again at the end of the day every single one of those films from Jaws 1 to Jaws 4 they still stir that that primal fear of being eaten <laughs> and you can apply that to every single one of them I don't care what the shark looked like how it looked like whatever and I mean everybody worked their asses off on all four films so if you're going to be a fan, if you're going to love, you need a reason to love the sequels, you know, and you don't like the way that the film was put together. Just just appreciate the fact that these actors and actresses busted their ass to try to bring something, try to bring this art to us yeah. and so that we can enjoy, you know, and it's just great stuff, you know. Yeah. So give it, give it to them, you know, show some love to you know everybody that was involved in any of these jaws films especially yeah. the first one but you know the, the sequels as well because everybody you know put their pants on and went to work to try to make the best project that they could possibly have you know yeah. so the complaints you know and, and comments and stuff could be a lot more positive you know with the with the film yeah the film absolutely so. jaws 1975 classic make sure y'all see it hey make sure if you like the video you know, like it, subscribe to the channel, like share, it, share it with your friends, share it on social media. Um, if, you, if you know a Jaws fan out there, send it to them. So, <laughs> <laughs> Please do. You know, yeah, we really do. appreciate it. Really appreciate the response we got to our video about uh, the movie Commando. I, uh, you know, that one went that one went very well. So really appreciate that. Check out the channel. We, so did, we did school days. You know, we did. Uh, Halloween 3, Action Jackson. Predator. Yeah, Predator. Check him out. Predator. Uh, um, we got a ton more yeah. coming. Yeah, we got a <laughs> much, bunch more coming. And it's October. Like we said, we're going to do some horror movies this month. So stay tuned. Got some surprises. And make sure y'all come back and see us. Definitely. Definitely. Take care. Peace.